Thank you very much, Al. Thank you, Alilia. Uh, it's really good of all of you to, uh, to come here on a Saturday. We really appreciate it. There are a lot of people from the university here, deans and vice presidents and, and provosts and so on, and we're all thrilled to be able to have an occasion like this and to interact with you and do it through a whole day. So we're very, very pleased that uh, you would uh, come. Um, I, I just want to say a few things about the state of Columbia and uh, uh, talk about the uh, expansion and what it means and, and uh, just a couple of other things. In general, I think this is a, an historic moment for Columbia. I think we have the sort of feeling of a new century and a new beginning and a, uh, opportunities for uh, our institution that are really very, very special. And our job is to try to help as much as possible this very great institution with an illustrious history uh, to realize its potential in the century. So the, it's, a, it's a great moment. Uh, before I uh, say something about the space and fundraising issues and the academic planning, uh, I want to just focus on two things that are in the New York Times uh, today. One, uh, the passing, the death of Manny Marable, uh, uh, and what that, uh, what that means. I mean, we all feel uh, deeply the sense of loss uh, when a faculty member, student, staff member uh, uh, dies. With Manny Marable, if you read that article, I think two things stand out. I think one is the depth of commitment, of personal commitment that great scholars have for their research, for their writing, for their laboratory experiments, uh, and for teaching. Uh, it is an incredible personal act of, of dedication to do what Manning did to bring uh, his uh, biography of Malcolm X to the point, given the personal uh, pain and suffering that he was enduring. So you just, all you have to do is read that article and it tells you something profound about the academic community why it is so successful in the world, the best in the world, and why Columbia uh, is so fortunate to uh, be at the very top of that uh, higher education system. And I think the second thing it, it tells us is that the value uh, of having people who spend their lives trying to understand the world, uh, what's happened to it, what might happen, what is true, what is not true, and without making any judgment about the uh, correctness of the interpretation that Manning's uh, biography of Malcolm X has, and it, it is extremely important that we have in the world institutions with people like this incredible talent dedicated to trying to understand the truth as they see it, according to the standards of, of scholarship. Uh, because we all live with greatly oversimplified versions of reality in our minds. Uh, it's just almost impossible uh, to live otherwise. And to have universities like Columbia uh, that day in and day out are trying to make the world more complicated because it is more complicated is really the greatest achievement. So there's nothing I can say today, or I think any of us can say, uh, about the institution, about what we're all dedicated to, committed to, uh, that go, would go beyond just reading that article uh, and knowing um, uh, Manning Marable. I think the second issue um, I'd just like to address very briefly is the ROTC. And the question really is, should Columbia uh, change its policy uh, with respect to having uh, ROTC on the campus. Already we have, of course, many military veterans. Uh, Columbia is outstanding in this regard, really notable, especially the School of General Studies. 
Uh, we have um, ROTC um, opportunities for our students um, in the area. There are, uh, there are really quite developed uh, programs uh, for our students. But we don't have and have not had an ROTC program housed on the campus uh, since uh, 1969 when, as everybody in this room knows, ROTC was, uh, uh, was told no, long, no longer welcome. I think we all realize that we're at a sort of historic moment on that front uh, as well. Uh, that is the projected elimination of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which has been the key stumbling block between uh, this relationship between universities and ROTC. That is in the process of being uh, changed. Uh, that opens the question uh, of the relationship and uh, I think the university, uh, through this year, has been uh, admirable in the way in which uh, students, faculty, university senate, uh, the council of deans, uh, schools have gone about trying to understand what should be our policy in light of the elimination of don't ask, don't tell. And uh, I just want to uh, highlight that for you as a tribute to the university and its capacity to have a debate, a discussion about this, and to uh, reach a conclusion, which I hope we will uh, by the end of this uh, month. Uh, Columbia is a place where almost everything is debated. Uh, nothing is left uh, for presidents to solve on their own or deans to solve on their own. Uh, everything is, is uh, debated and debated strongly, and there's no exception here, and of course that's why we all uh, love Columbia. Um, the university, very quickly, uh, the, why is this a great moment? Well, for a hundred years, uh, Columbia has not had, or that's a little bit of an exaggeration, for 50 years Columbia has not had the opportunity to grow in the way that it, it physically, uh, spatially, in the way that it did at the beginning of the 20th century. And I say, and many of you may have heard me say this before, but I really believe its power. Columbia became one of the greatest institutions, I think the greatest university, pound for pound, uh, in the world, by mid-century of the last century, precisely because it had this chance to grow as knowledge grew and the role of universities in American society changed and flourished in Columbia could expand, we always want more students, we always want more faculty because knowledge grows, and uh, it was done very, very well. But it had to have the space uh, to do that because it was a small college with a few professional schools at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, but the Morningside Heights and then the Washington Heights and Lamont Doherty really made it possible to become what it uh, was by mid-century. But since the late 60s, maybe a little bit before that, Columbia has, uh, has had serious problems in dealing with uh, trying to, uh, to expand. So the Manhattanville uh, new campus in Harlem, on the river, 18 acres, six to seven million square feet, uh, is a magnificent opportunity for the institution. The last stage of the process, had to go through rezoning in the city, that was not easy. Um, and then uh, the last stage of the process was a, a litigation before the United States Supreme Court involving uh, eminent domain against the two businesses that were um, holding out and therefore would make it impossible really to build the campus as projected. That ended in December. So all the process is done. Uh, it is now up to the university over the next 50 years to create this new campus, which is on a scale like Morningside Heights uh, itself. Now we have an opening phase one. Phase two and three, which will happen in future decades, are for future uh, uh, members of the Columbia community to decide. But in phase one, uh, which will happen over the next five to ten years, this is what you will see. The Mind Brain Behavior Institute is led by our two Nobel Prize winners, uh, Eric Kandel, Richard Axel, and uh, another very distinguished uh, cell 
um, biologist um, Tom Jessel, uh, a neuroscientist, and those three will build up what is already one of the premier neuroscience programs in the world to the best uh, neuroscience program. And it will be an interdisciplinary uh, effort because every other discipline thinks about the mind, though from different angles. Uh, economists do, lawyers do, uh, artists do, and they will be integrated into this effort. With the gift of Don Green in honor of her husband, Jerome Green, uh, $250 million, the largest gift ever for a single building, uh, that project is underway, and if you go to 125th Street, 129th Street, and Broadway, you will see uh, the beginnings of, of that. It's been approved by the trustees. We are off. And there are new uh, gifts that we will have to announce, I hope shortly, that will help establish a foundation for the programming, for the building of the academic mission. Next to it, or right adjacent to it, are two smaller buildings, one so-called the Lantern, which will be the School of the Arts. That will be in another, that new building, and then an older building right across the street called Prentice. And we will have there a theater. We'll have a film viewing studio. We'll probably have a, an art gallery uh, on the main floor. And then on the other side, on, on Broadway uh, and 125th, will be an academic conference center. One of the things we lack at Columbia is a building with space like this for us to hold academic meetings and conferences and smaller venues as well. And we're very fortunate with some significant gifts, not yet quite ready to be announced, but very significant gifts for both of those projects that I believe uh, will lead us to be able to say very shortly that we are going ahead with those as well. So four years from now, possibly five, those buildings will open. SEPA has another building that we've designated uh, for that uh, school. Uh, we're uh, further away from success in fundraising there, but working very hard and with good prospects. And then just north of that on uh, the new campus will be the business school, two buildings flanking the central quadrangle, which is about the size of South Lawn. And uh, that has received a wonderful start from a gift uh, of $100 million from Henry Kravis, which we announced in the fall. And they have to raise $400 million, uh, $300 million more, over the next uh, year to have that go. I am absolutely confident that they will do that, we will do that. And that means over the next six, seven years, uh, that building will open. That will free up space on Morningside Heights, uh, the Eurus building will go to arts and sciences, and uptown, uh, the mind-brain behavior and the work there will free up space for basic sciences uh, there. So everybody is benefited by this. Uh, the linkages between these will be very important, but I'm confident that all of this will enhance the basic intellectual enterprise uh, of Columbia. Now, the first step in the new space is the Northwest Corner Building, completed by Rafael Mineo to acclaimed uh, uh, architectural critics uh, review. Uh, it is quite a stunning uh, building. It is the last building on Morningside Heights campus under the original plan. We started this five years ago, and as I said, it just opened in the fall. And so you has the, have this kind of poetic um, uh, conclusion, that is, 115 years ago, Seth Lowe presided over a small ceremony that laid the cornerstone building for Lowe Library. And at that point said it would take a long time to complete Morningside Heights campus. Well, 115 years later, we've completed Morningside Heights campus with this wonderful building. And it's now already filled, or all, not filled, but it's on the, in the way of being filled uh, with interdisciplinary science, nanoscience, and, and so on. Again, a great, great asset for our uh, science and for engineering. So that will link, and if you look at it, it links both visually and, and scientifically with the new 
mind-brain behavior building that, as I said, will be the first building to go up in Manhattanville. You'll be able to see both of them. From uh, Each will be able to see the other. So they sort of open uh, up to the new campus. I think the other thing to, to mention going to the f uh, funding, which I, I think is important only as an example uh, or an, it's emblematic of the commitment of people to the university. When we launched the capital campaign uh, five years ago, uh, six years ago, we, it, we aimed very high. Four billion dollars, the largest of any university in the United States, except for Stanford at 4.25. And we completed the $4 billion goal on, I think it was February 7th of this year, a year early, despite the Great Recession. And despite, <laughs> and that's the work of the deans in this room. It is the work of, uh, of a staff that is really quite incredible, led by Susan Fagan, and now by Fred Van Sickle. Uh, whom you will uh, hear from shortly. I mean, this is an enormous uh, statement of the commitment of people to uh, Columbia University. Well, like any good fundraising operation, we extended the capital campaign another two years and raised the goal to $5 billion. And that's what we're now engaged in trying to do. It is also a mark of the institution's financial strength and commitment of people to it, that the capital campaign includes gifts projected into the future, pledges as well as current gifts. In terms of actual current gifts, we are now regularly in the top five, right after Stanford and Harvard, in the amount of money raised every single year. And that's not where we were 10 years ago. We were about 13th or 14th year in and year out. And now we're, we're absolutely in the top five. If you look at the investment performance, it's equally stunning. Um, in the last five years, the performance of our endowment and returns is the highest of any institution in the country with an endowment of a billion dollars or more. So that's how uh, financially strong Columbia is becoming uh, in those uh, particular ways. And again, it's a tribute. The last thing I want to just say is uh, uh, the place is thriving. You hear about the number of applicants to the college. You hear about the greatness in the schools that are represented here. Uh, there's so many things to say about this wonderful, rich, large institution with 22, 23,000 students and thousands of faculty, and uh, it, it really quite an impressive place. But one of the things we're trying to do is to figure out what globalization means for Columbia. And Columbia is already very, very international, has the second or third largest international student population of any university in the United States. We have great regional institutes. We have the School of International and Public Affairs. Public health, as you will hear, has led uh, public health schools and, and universities in, in international programs. Every single school is rich in its uh, attention to global issues. All that said, we all know that the world is changing in ways very, very rapidly. In China going through an industrial revolution in a couple of generations that took 200 years in the West, uh, on and on. This is a profound time of, of, of change. And universities are typically slow to move. We don't, uh, we don't think about things deeply and long, and, and uh, we're not into just going with what happens at the moment. Nevertheless, we have to be attuned to the broader forces at work in any given time. And one of the things we're doing is saying we're not going to go the, the route of having branch campuses. This is something other universities are doing. And I can explain why another time. What we're doing is setting up offices, facilities, staffs who are highly sophisticated, very much rooted in, in the regions. Uh, and those will help our faculty and students 
work on real projects, real research with local institutions, and then join all of those in a network to think about global problems. You can't any longer, the thesis is, think about Africa without thinking about China and vice versa. And you can't think about the Middle East without thinking about Europe. And, and all of this has to be part, much more part of our, uh, of our life at Morningside Heights, Washington Heights, Le Mans Doherty, than it is presently. And we now have centers, uh, global centers we're calling them, set up and running in Amman, Jordan, in Mumbai, India, in Beijing, Paris, uh, and we're about, we're in the process of opening them in Istanbul, uh, in Santiago, uh, Chile, and in Nairobi. And over the next several years, I think we'll see uh, Colombia having a stronger, greater presence all over the world. Uh, and that will help us with connecting with alumni, with recruiting students, uh, with forming new relationships, with fundraising, and, and the like. And, and uh, you should watch that and see how, um, how the university is developing as a global institution. So thank you very much for being here. I hope that gives you some sense of the uh, exciting moment at the university. Look forward to today. Thanks. <laughs>